in there. Right. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the Clarkdale Town Council at the Clark Memorial Clubhouse on Tuesday, October 10th, 2023, at 6 p.m. Um, Vice Mayor Hunsetter. Here. Council Member O'Neill. Here. Council Member Jones. Present. Council Member Babbitt Pierce. Uh, note that she's on her way she, and we'll um, acknowledge her when she gets here. And uh, note that uh, Mayor Fernand Bauer here, we have a quorum. Uh, why don't we go ahead and open up to the third item, which is public comment. This is the time um, members of the public may give comment of a general nature. No action may be taken by the council during this time unless it is to direct staff to look into a matter, in, into a matter. Uh, public comments are limited to five minutes. And I believe we have Martha would like to speak. So Martha, come on up and state your name and if you're a Clarkdale resident. My name is Martha Lysel and I am a Clarkdale resident. I just have two things, I'll be quick. Uh, one of them, when the street sweeper comes around, I wonder if there's some way that the citizenry can be notified in advance so we can get our cars off the street and then they can do a much better job. That's a little thing. The only other thing I was wondering if the council could look into perhaps painting the curb red for no parking zone on 16th between First South and Main Street, just on the downside of the school. Frequently, parents park there. They like to watch their children frolicking on the playground and stuff. And so you'll get parents parked on this side, residents parked on this side, and you can barely get through. Okay. You would not be able to get an emergency vehicle through. And they also park in front of a fire hydrant, which doesn't seem like the safest place to park. So those are my two things. If the council could perhaps look into the, the painting that red and letting us know when the streets we work out. Thank you, Martha, Thank you. very Thank much. You. We'll get back to you on that, okay? okay. Um, please note that Council Member Babbitt Pierce is here, so we have a, a full quorum. Welcome, Marty. Thank you. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Oh, I'm fine. Apologies Good. for being late. <laughs> no problem. Um, is there anybody online who wishes to speak? No, there is not. Um, Anybody else in the audience wishing to give public comment? Okay, uh, hearing none, let's move on to report. The next item on the agenda are reports that include current events, organizational reports, and a special uh, and, a, and a, organizational reports, period. Um, the first item is current and current events. The mayor's, vice mayor, and council members' reports are all in the packets. And online, um, you notice that we have a new format for them. So it's very simple and easy and it'll be consistent for the public. Um, organizational reports, uh, Cottonwood Area Transit. No meeting. No meeting. Um, VBTPO, Verde Valley Transportation Planning Organization. We met two weeks ago. And as soon as we have notes, I will share them. Okay. Uh, NACOG. We just had the executive uh, board meeting. Okay. Um, NAMWA, Northern Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. Meeting next Friday. Okay. Uh, Transportation Policy Advisory Council. Uh, no meeting. Uh, Verde Front Leadership Council. Uh, we had a meeting on September 25th. And it's uh, just was a continuation of our Verde Front strategic planning. I believe there's another meeting coming up on October 19th. Um, I think uh, town manager Guthrie is going to be there because I will not be making that one. But um, it's a, a good process we've been going through and was some very good, um, um, I think, uh, direction that will come out of it. Um, Greater Arizona Mayor's organizational organization. Um, they we have an upcoming quarterly meeting on October 27th. 
um, in uh, Dewey Humboldt. Uh, sustaining Flows Committee. We did meet um, and we had a lot of conversation about things that folks are doing across communities um, to address water issues in our communities. And I think they were impressed with what Parkdale has been doing. And then the second part, we had another meeting last week where we're looking at the water, groundwater model for the whole Verde region. So it is, and that's with the, with the sustaining flows, the Nature Conservancy and the Yavapai Apache Nation, trying to look at the groundwater model to see where there are overages in the system and what we can do to improve groundwater pumping and reduce groundwater pumping in the system and what kind of capacity do we have here in the Verde. So there's some good meetings. And I think I provided minutes from the last one. Okay. That's the one that I've been, the, the fl uh, flows modeling meeting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and you have a community for young children. We have our quarterly meeting the end of the month. End of? The month. Month, okay. Okay, that's all of our organizational uh, meetings. Uh, let's go to item five, consent agenda. Uh, we have uh, one item on consent tonight. It's the minutes of our September 26, 2023 uh, town council meeting. Uh, are any comments on those minutes? Hearing none, why don't I would entertain a motion on consent agenda, item A. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Vice Mayor Hunsetter and seconded by Council Member Jones to a, approve consent agenda item A as presented. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion carried. Let's move on to new business. Um, item 6A is letter of findings, the town manager's annual evaluation. I believe it's my pleasure to speak to this. <laughs> um, on September 26, 2023, the town council met uh, in executive dis uh, session to discuss and evaluate town manager Susan Guthrie's performance over the last uh, past year uh, per her uh, contract with us. Town council members uh, ranked Ms. Guthrie's performance um, exceeding expectations um, and the objective sections were also overwhelmingly uh, positive. Uh, councils were unanimous in their approval of uh, Susan's performance um, in that she exceptionally fulfilled her duties as town manager, as manager of the town and a representative of the town to other jurisdiction groups and to the town citizens. Um, all counselors mentioned that Susan has done an outstanding job connecting elements of our um, capital improvement plan projects and the council agenda to the strategic goals while maintaining an open door policy and exhibiting a, contain, a, con, contain, a, a contagious excuse me, spirit of fun. Um, we have really fun quarterly um, employee gatherings. Um, which is great. Um, Susan has also been instrumental in seeking out and obtaining over $12 million in grant opportunities for the town of Clarkdale. It is with my sincere pleasure to write this evaluation. We give her a copy of this evaluation to state uh, our uh, unambiguous satisfaction with Ms. Guthrie's performance of her duties, her dedication to the town, to her staff, and her job is second to none. The town of Clarkdale is a better place and has more efficient and effective government because of Susan Guthrie as our town manager. And with that, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you so thank much. You. Any comments from yeah. council members? I, I guess I want to look this document up. <laughs> Uh, town manager Guthrie shared this with us tonight, and this is the town's list of master projects. It is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pages long. 
Um, it covers That's big. It, it connects <laughs> ten pages long. Well, um, no pictures. It, I think what is impressive about this is that it clearly connects the work that the town is doing and that town manager Guthrie is directing. Um, and it can it connects it all completely with our goals and that have been set with our strategic plan. And I know we talked about that in our discussion and how clear it is how what the town is doing, where their efforts are going, are actually connected to what has been laid out and how the progress is going with those. And to be able to, she literally just handed this to us, but to be able to go through and see what's been complete, what's in process, what needs to be done next, um, and that anybody can see this, um, and that the staff understand this is really spectacular. And I think the staff on all levels understand this. I don't think it's just the managers. I think it's everybody understands what they're doing and how it is being done. And I think that is to be commended because I think one of the things I know I said was, I appreciate your ability to see things at the 10,000 foot view and understand them at the 20 foot view. And I think that has translated into the staff really understanding what they need to do to accomplish these goals. Because I think often, I know I hear this from people, oh, you know, and we hear it about the governments in general and about their efficiencies in that. And so to me, this document is sort of the physical manifestation <laughs> of that work. So thank you. I guess that's my well said. Yep, very well said. Any other comments? Well, like I said before, there's a lot of green on this paper. Yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing accomplishment in two, less than two years. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve the letter of findings regarding the town manager's annual evaluation. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. You second. <laughs> you second. It's been moved by Council Member Babbitt Pearson, second about Council Member O'Neill to approve the letter of findings regarding the town manager's annual evaluation. No further comments? And I just have, yes. I, and I said this to you when you were met with me in executive session, but I have to say it publicly is my performance is 100% based upon the performance of our entire team. And you're right. I think every one of them know what's on that list and We've got several of them sitting in the audience today who firsthand filled this out, Virginia, Ruth, Julie. So they do all know and, you know, are really bought into what we're trying to achieve. And it, it really is because of their work. So just want to make sure you all know that. <laughs> Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carried. Um, let's move on to item 6B, Town Manager's Employment Agreement. Um, it's been presented to all of you. Um, any questions anybody has on it? Um, hearing uh, none, um, I'll uh, entertain a motion. Madam uh, Mayor, I recommend that we approve the renewal of the town manager agreement for Susan Guthrie. Is there a second? I'll second that. It's been moved by Vice Mayor Hunsetter and seconded by uh, Council Member Jones to approve the town manager's employment agreement for Susan Guthrie. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carried. Okay, let's move on to item 6C, uh, ordinance um, 422, amending the town code chapter three, section two dash five, town attorney. And I think uh, town manager Guthrie is gonna speak to this. Yes, ma'am. Um, the ordinance regarding town attorney's duties says that we need to consult with the town attorney on all contracts and ordinances and documents that are coming before council. Um, however, we also have our risk pool, AMRRP, and the risk pool provides some legal services free to us. And so particularly on personnel matters, they're experts, um, intergovernmental agreements, development agreements, and several other topics. 
So I discussed it with Stephen, um, how he'd feel about if we were able to have the option, depending on what the topic was, to seek out that uh, representation. And he said he actually goes to them sometimes as well. So I think we all agree, let's do what's fiscally better for the community. And not only that, but we have so much going on right now that it's a big load um, for him. And, you know, we're always emailing, trying to push our top, you know, our, our item to the top of the list. So I think this will just spread the work out a little bit more and give us options. Um, is there any questions um, on this item? Yes. I just want to say thank you for being so on top of this, knowing what our town code says, so that we make sure that we are operating within the bounds of that and also knowing what our risk pool provides, because you're right, we are asking Stephen to do a lot right now. And the reality is he is an expert in many things, but he is not an expert in all things. And so being able to have someone who is an expert in very specific things like personnel, so that we can get those things dealt with in a timely manner to the benefit of our community, I think is really important. So thank, thank you. you. Well, and a shout out to Julie because she took the, the short end of the stick and sat through a two hour presentation from <laughs> AMRP. So she was able to kind of fill us in on the extent of the services they provide. So thanks, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Julie. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> always good to have more options. It is always good to have more options and resources we can tap for all of our things. Yes. And second opinions. I mean, yeah. Second opinions sometimes are really nice also. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will take a motion if there's no other comments. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve Ordinance 422, amending Town Code Chapter 3, Section 2 through 5, Town Attorney, to include the use of AMRRP attorneys as legal counselors for the town. Okay, it's been moved by Vice Mayor Hunsetter and seconded by Council Member Babbitt Pierce to approve Ordinance 422, amending Town Code Chapter 3, Section 2 through 5, Town Attorney, to include the use of AMRRP attorneys as legal counsel for the town. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carried. Okay, well, let's move on to item 6D, which is discussion of 2022-23 legislative sessions related to um, Town of Clarkdale's community development. And I have Assistant Town Manager uh, Ruth Mayday here to do the uh, presentation. This item is for discussion only. There's no action. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight we're going to have a little chat about what the legislature was up to this year uh, and how they've helped us. So um, I went to the Planning um, Association conference in the beginning of September, and I'm sure it was a lot like the League conference where we talked about housing, housing regulation, housing supply, housing zoning, and everything else you could possibly talk about at housing. So it's going to be a big, it was a big topic this session and I don't expect that to change. <clears throat> so one of the big bills this year was um, uh, SB 1117, which we call the Terminator because it pretty much ended uh, local control over zoning matters as they uh, applied to housing. Uh, this bill was introduced by Senator Kaiser in January, right at the beginning of the session. Uh, it affected, 13 different sections of Arizona revised statutes. Uh, it started as a teeny tiny little amendment to a teeny tiny little piece of, of cities and town statutes. And it blew into uh, probably six pages of changes to various parts of um, ARS. It finally died on March 13th. Thankfully, um, there were a lot of it changed hourly at the end. I mean, it just, it, every 10 minutes you would get a notification that they've changed, they've added, they've subtracted, they've struck. At the end, Kaiser resigned from the Senate in frustration, which is unfortunate that it, it got to that point. So why are we talking about a bill that is did not get approved, did not make any movement at all? 
<laughs> I'll be back. Be back. That was the advice of all of the attorneys oh, yes. at uh, the um, Planning Association, both those who represent um, builders and developers, those from the league, uh, and those from other organizations that lobbied uh, on behalf or against that bill, is that this is coming back in some form or another in the upcoming session. And until we can get some sort of traction on housing in Arizona, they will be continuing to make changes to how we manage housing and, and development in Arizona. If they if they don't do it all as one bill, they might do it as little pieces. So right. it might be like a thousand cuts to planning. Yes. Okay. So one of those cuts, as a matter of fact, they did do some cutting for us, um, is SB 1103 or Politics Make Strange Bedfellows. Uh, this was a group of very diverse um, um, uh, stakeholders. It was um, a lot of, there was uh, people involved from the Homeless Coalition. Uh, there were people involved from the Home Builders Association. Uh, this again was also in, um, introduced at the beginning of the legislative session. Uh, it was actually approved by the governor and um, it gives the municipality the ability to make changes to their, their code to authorize far greater latitude for staff to make approvals for um, site plans, they listed everything, site plans, development plans, preliminary plats, final plats, design review plans, as long as they're based on objective standards and we can do those without a public hearing. So there's a lot packed into this because um, uh, there are a lot of things that we can be doing and that staff it has the capability of doing at, at the staff level. There are lots of reviews that do not require going to um, uh, a town council for approval. And we already do some of these. When we're talking about uh, combinations of parcels outside of a platted subdivision, we already do those. We can do some land divisions without a council approval. Um, I would suggest that it would be a good idea to expand uh, staff's ability to approve minor subdivisions because those are only up to, to uh, uh, 10 lots. So the impact is far less. And I think that uh, um, uh, allowing for subdivisions of certain sizes to have uh, the smaller the subdivision, the, the fewer meetings it should take to re approve that. And conversely, the larger subdivisions where they do have a great impact on the community should go through that process where there are public hearings and the, the residents of Clarkdale have an opportunity to chime in on what they think about these projects. Um, some of the other things that it does is allow us to adopt or allow for us a self-certification programs that so for the architects and the engineers and the builders that we work with, all the time for them to self-certify. So I don't have, if I have an engineer that I know does good work and when we send their, their, their documents out for review, we may get one or two or three minor comments, right? Versus those that we know come in and we're gonna have to pay a lot of attention because there are not, there are always mistakes. So those that'll self-certify will say, I'm gonna stand behind my work here. I'm, I've stamped this, this is good and they can skip that review process to the extent that um, we can move that project along, it, it will help with the uh, housing market. Um, allowing for at-risk submittals for a certain on-site preliminary drainage work, we generally allow people to do that already. At-risk is at risk. If you're going to take that risk and start pushing dirt around and there's a problem, then you're responsible for that. And we make it abundantly clear with the, with the contractors that do that, that this is the risk that they're taking, hence the name at risk. Um, and then allow applicants with a history of compliance with building codes and regulations to do expedited permit review. Again, it, with the, that engineer review example, we also have contractors that we know will call us if there's an issue, will come that will produce good plans for us to review so that we don't have to go through the exact same review for everybody. If, if their work is good, if we can rely on what they've submitted, then we should be able to go ahead and let them move a little more quickly rather than keep them in line behind somebody who submitted before them, but whose work is a little bit troublesome. 
So we'll be coming back with some code amendments to allow some of this uh, for more discussion and consideration in the future. Um, can you go back to 103? Um, I understand expediting this, I, you know, because the League of Cities and Towns also supported this and, and the like. Um, but just cautionary is um, on some of this is taking out that public um, hearing process is a lit or a, some way of the public being able to comment. Um, so for some of them, we, we it's up to council. They get to decide whether or not we exempt some of these processes okay. from public hearings. Like I said, there are some that we have minimal people, either nobody shows up or we get Correct. two people that show up. Yeah. And there are certainly, um, with the internet ways, we can post these things and ask people to contact us if they have issues or questions and, and take comment that way. But for larger subdivisions, uh, larger commercial projects, those things, absolutely, I don't think it is wise for, uh, for Clarkdale to set aside that public hearing process. Because typically, despite the fact that we'll go back and forth several times, and, and the plateau is a very good example of that. They came in with a design, everybody went, ah. So they went back to the drawing board, they came back, we worked through it, we took comments from the public, and they, they were engaged in that process. And I think that engagement is important. Um, but if you're talking like a 10 lot bare dirt subdivision, there really isn't a lot to take comment on. So, and again, those are the kinds of things, the smaller things are the things that we would be doing without public hearing. It would be nice to go what, it would be nice to know from your perspective from, um, and your staff, where, where what guidelines you're using yes. to determine when you're doing a public hearing or when you're not. So. I'm just saying, I think that would be good for us to know. Exactly. And that's something that we absolutely would incorporate in anything we brought forward. Okay. In terms of some of these other things where we're speeding up the process, do you have an estimate of, you know, are we talking about speeding things up by days, by weeks? Um, it dep it's project dependent, but uh, um, for the most part, it would probably be weeks, It'd be a couple of weeks that we would spe speed things up. If we're not going to we're not going to get out of a year of anything. That's just that's not going to happen. There's nothing that we can do internally that's going to take a year off of a process. But definitely for um, some of these other small, again, smaller projects, we can certainly go through and approve some of these things without a public hearing and get those projects moving. Same with some of the building permits. Sure. Um, this just applies to residential, not commercial? No, it would apply to both. Both, okay. Right. And does it also impact at all the inspection process once you're under construction? No, it would not impact the inspection in, um, process at all. We would still have the same inspections would be required. Absolutely. Okay. But um, when you said that it also would affect commercial, how do you gauge the size of that, whether it would be streamlined or not? Um, basically square footage. You know, the, the bigger the project, the bigger the detail, the bigger the plan. So greater uh, projects with greater square footage or greater acreage in footprint. So it would be the difference between, um, for instance, Tawaki versus the uh, RV, uh, Rain Spirit RV Park. Right, the, the footprint for Tawaki is smaller, but when you're talking about the entire floor area ratio for both floors versus the area of the um, uh, RV park. Mm -hmm. So when you look at them that way, they're both relatively the same size. They both impact the same area. And so those would be treated more similarly than revitalizing a building downtown because these are much smaller buildings. So you're saying that something like Tawaki or Rain Spirit would go through this accelerated process? No, 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 would probably oh. not. No, would they okay. would actually go through the exact same process because again, you're talking about, especially with respect to new construction, it would be a much more detailed process than a rehab. Okay, thank you. I guess I might. Yes, Laura. I might. Uh, 
repeat what has a bit of what's been said, but I have great concern about anything that's going to take anything out of public process. I think that it I'd rather see us figure out how to get more people engaged mm -hmm. than set up a system that engages fewer people. So I appreciate that sometimes you guys do a lot of work and only two people show up. Um, but I think it is important that those two people show up and I would like to see more energy, I guess, put into seeing eight or 10 or 20 people show up. And I know people are motivated by different things, but I am greatly concerned about how you draw the line uh -huh. about what goes, what now doesn't go to design review board, what does go to design review board, what goes to planning commission, what doesn't go to planning commission, what goes here, what goes there. And I, and I, I think it, if we make any kind of a change, it has to be incredibly clear what those lines are. Exactly. Because I don't mm -hmm. want there to be any sort of sense of, oh, well, this person didn't have to do it, but that person had to do it. And then that guy got moved to the front of the line. You know, I'm with you that if you have a contractor who you work with and you know their materials and there's somebody who's holding up the line oh. here, there should be a process to get that person, you know, moving faster because they're you know what more they're prepared going. and ready to do the work. But I also don't necessarily, I have to think greatly about supporting codifying into code that some people don't have to go through those processes. So that, that, Cause when I, you, you, Marnie can see my yellow highlight on my, <laughs> on my notes from, the, from what we read, what we got. And so that just, so I'm, I'm just saying whatever it is that you bring back to us, if you bring anything back to mm -hmm. us, whatever that is, I think it needs to be really clear. And so that it is very clear to the public what goes on and i i'm thinking of one example that has nothing to do with here but i like i think it's san diego county that has eight adu units that if you use their plan and you you use one of those eight plans you get a stamp and you move ahead and you you get moved to the front of the line and you don't have to so like i understand that expediting of you know things and, and i think it's great but i just think i guess i'm i yeah so i guess i just want us to be Clear if we're going to take anything out of that public process, what that is, and how we're, how how and why we're doing that. Oh, yeah. There's a technical term for that. Yeah, it's called plan in a can. Plan in a can. Very technical. <laughs> White County has some of those. But, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I always say so, San Diego example, but I know you have a White County actually has some of those. Yeah, for housing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think there's wonderful ways to use things like this because I think we do all need to be encouraging, especially around housing. How do we, you know, how do we move those balls forward? Um, but I also am also very worried about taking things out of the public purview. No, and, and, and our own our own structure of process and how we review things and our the value of our boards and commissions. And I agree completely. And this was a nice gesture that the legislature did to try to provide that opportunity for communities and by and large I agree that there are that the public process and, and doing things and public hearings and having people be engaged is a really really good thing but there are some things that we we can do you know like I said the the lot splits and the minor land divisions those things are just passing paper you know if you've got the if the if the surveys the lots all close then there's no re it and the they meet the minimum lot sizes and they meet all the zoning requirements. That's not something that really town council has to be taking a look at. But when we're talking about other things, I agree completely. I'm not talking, I don't, staff has no plan to say, yay, no more public hearings. That's not where we're going. No, no, and I appreciate that. I just think we need to make it clear what yes. those. And those are the um, objective standards that they were talking about. Lisa. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to offer a vote of confidence. This is just a discussion, and mm -hmm. I've always felt that you tried to be very clear with us. I appreciate that Clarkdale is expediting the permit process by putting it online, making it easier to understand. Clarkdale has had a reputation in the past of being difficult to do business in, and I appreciate efforts to streamline and as I said, this is a discussion. The, the comments are great. Yes. I'm sure they'll be considered. I just wanted to let you know that somebody is just going, 
forward. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, really, this is why we brought this because this is so game changing, yes, right? Yes. And the question is really, how far does council want to go? Because I don't want to bring you something that you're going to, oh, this isn't what we want at all. It's just a waste of everyone's time. So to have the feedback, we we sincerely appreciate that. All right, so. Anything else on this item? And if we have some more thoughts, we'll share them with you in writing the, um, and before you come back with something. I think, I mean, we're, You've heard a lot from us tonight. Um, this is this is a, is a game changer. It really is. Um, if you if you look at it, I, I agree a lot with what um, everybody has said here. So the sentiments are there. We want to move things forward in a very expedited manner. I don't want to be. I don't think any of us want us to be a town that that is saying no to everything or putting, you know, taking our sweet time sure. and and stuff like that. But also, if we can find ways, whether it's um, in addition to having public hearings when we need it, but for people just to comment on them, even through online and stuff like you suggested, that would be great also. Because uh, I think, you know, people um, make their wishes known uh, in different ways. And the more we can do that, the better off it is for uh, all the plans coming out because it just helps. But this is this is this is a huge game changer for um, communities. It really is. The idea of proving a plat with no public hearing mm -hmm. scares me. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> okay. All right, 2019, time is not on my side. So um, in 2011, the uh, legislature approves uh, Senate Bill 1598, which set forth a whole slew of, re of, of regulations about time for approvals and so forth. And I don't wanna go into all of those details, but um, this sets a de definitive time for us for approval for 60 days after we we find that an application is complete. So a lot of times we'll get applications in and people want us to start reviewing them right away and we can't because parts are missing. And then they're like, well, you're dragging your feet. So what 1598 did is said, look, you have a certain amount of time and you get to decide what that time is to make sure that all of the parts are of the application are here. And you have now two chances to get those things into your office. After that, you now have at least no more than 60 days to get this approved unless you set your own time frame. So we're gonna be going back through um, the ordinance and seeing where we are with compliance with 1598 and making sure that we have those, again, definitive time periods so that people understand what they're applying for and what the timeline will be. So can I just make sure I understand that? So I come to you with a project mm -hmm. and it's got, eight out of the 10 things it needs. And you say to me, where's your other two? I get you the other two. Now I have, you. Now the town has 60 days to to approve that. Right, approve or deny, yep. Yeah, approve or deny, yep. And so, how, I mean, right now, does it usually take us 60 days? Again, it's project dependent. If we have a project that requires a lot of engineering, those take a lot of time. I don't. We don't have a staff engineer, so we have to send all of that out and we're, completely beholden to their workload. So this is going to be lighting a fire under the engineers, frankly, to get them to respond fast. Or, or any of the other agencies. Or any of the other revert viewing agencies. From. Right, ADOT, any of them. So getting, it, it, it's to ensure that there is a minimum, statewide minimum that you have to respond by, which is 60 days. You know, a typical single family residential custom home, we probably turn that around in two, maybe three weeks if it's super complex. But we do, those we go fairly quickly. We'll start getting into large commercial projects or, you know, any kind of tricky siting of, project, uh, of, of a home or something that's on a hillside and now you have slope and engineering and bank stabilization. And all of that takes longer. So we make sure everything is, we've got all the parts we need, then we do the review. Any other questions on this one? Could somebody get a review in, in uh, steps, for example, re review the plan for the foundation and 
get that underway while you are completing maybe the framing steps and stuff like that? Or is it a, an entire project has to be completely presented and accepted or rejected? Our preference, unless it's something super huge, like I've seen that done with things like hospitals mm -hmm. because they're so complex and it would take forever to get them approved to, to, to do a step review. But really since 1598, very few people or very few jurisdictions are willing to do it just because of the legal battles that will ensue. Does, does this work to your favor in being able to say to people, we need all your documents before we can move forward? Yeah, it really does. It because, like I said, we get things in that aren't complete. You know, they're not, we'll have plans that aren't stamped or engineering that is missing a page. You know, you're supposed to have twelve pages, and I only have nine. So it will help us, and that way we can again set those aside because they're not complete, and deal with the ones that are complete that come in later. So. 2547, every day I write the book. So this requires us now when we do um, any sort of text amendments or zoning changes that affect housing, we have to go through and do an analysis of the impact on the housing that may be impacted by the change or the, the zone change or the text amendment. So we have to look at the probable impact on cost of the housing. We have to provide a description of the data that we use, and we have to figure out what would be cheaper. So this is going to add a lot to anything we do uh, regarding approving housing or text amendments, approving housing zoning changes or text amendments. These are now required. Can you say why this was yeah, given a done? Do you, know? say, do you have an example? An example of when this would be done? Mm -hmm. So for instance, if we came back and we made changes, so R1L zoning is so single family residential one acre lots. So we said, all right, we're now we're gonna make it R1 three quarters. It's only three quarter of an acre lot. So now what is the impact of that change to that zone with respect to housing? Well, the how this change would be the lots are smaller, so we could put more more homes in. That would lower the cost in theory of the of the lots, right? Because you have more supply demand. Um, and then we base this on the law of supply and demand. And there, the only way to make this less costly would be to make the lot sizes all five thousand square feet. That would be off the top. That would be a good example of what we would be looking at. It would be a lot more elaborate, but that's typically what we would be looking I'm, at. I'm trying to understand the intent of this. I think I mean I know why they I saw that it was done, but I still didn't quite understand why. I think the intent is to prevent um, municipalities from making changes in their ordinance to make it more difficult or more expensive to build homes or multifamily apartment buildings. I think that's that to me is when I read this, I, that's what comes to mind is that, you know, uh, there are jurisdictions that are either adapting design standards or lot sizes or things like that that don't really make any sense other than to slow down the growth of housing in your community. And this is this is a way to combat that. OK, if you want to do that now, you have to explain to us what was your basis for doing this? What was your. What's the rationale? What's the impact on the housing market? And how is it going to affect cost? So how much more time does this take? And what expertise do you have to have to write these? Well, this only happens if we change a zoning. Right. So if we if we have a zone change or if we have a text amendment, right, that's when this would kick in. And that doesn't happen very often, does it? It doesn't happen very often. No, yeah. it won't happen very, here it would not happen very often in other jurisdictions, you know, if you're talking would about, be like, you have to remember this goes from Clarkdale to, to Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah, and it would probably happen in Phoenix a lot more than it would happen. Mm -hmm. 2373, so this authorizes the use of qual qualified online automated permitting platforms for approval of solar energy devices. So we have an online platform for permitting. However, this speaks specifically ones that you literally 
scan your plans in, the software reviews the plans and produces comments. We don't have that. So um, they did change the regulations with respect for, to electrical plans. Uh, we are no longer allowed to require three line plans. We can only require one line, which has to do with the number of lines that are shown for where the electricity goes in the electrical diagrams. That's the simple explanation for that. This is 2143, bridge over troubled water. We've all been talking about um, reuse of water and recycling. So this uh, bill was introduced and it limits our ability. In fact, it takes away our any ordinances that we have that would limit gray water use if the, if the ordinance that we have with those regulations is not in compliance with the ADEQ regulations. So um, ADEQ is looking at new regulations for regulating reclaimed water, trying to figure out what we can do with all of the water that we have cleaned. And so I expect more work um, at the state level with this, both through ADEQ and the legislature. And, 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 and you know, and you know, in your, also your report, uh, we, we need to see how this is balanced with the international building and residential codes. Exactly. Correct. So several of these may can conflict with the, with the building codes that the town has adopted, especially the gray water one, because they have very specific regulations on pipes and what you can and can't use and what they don't do and don't consider gray water. So there's some reconciliation that's going to have to happen. With ADEQ and most municipalities use the um, International Code Council. So, and ADEQ's time frame for getting these new regulations, who knows? Okay. They're not subject to the 60 days. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd be happy to have to answer any of the questions you have. If you think of anything else, please, you know, let Susan know and she'll shoot me an email and share your thoughts and we'll incorporate it all. And I was just going to add that um, Charity, who's not here tonight, did a great job with taking every law that was passed during this session and that applies to municipalities and putting it in a spreadsheet. And we assigned a staff member to every one of those to review, to determine the impact to us and what changes we need to make operationally. So Ruth's were the trickiest of those, but everybody has a group of um, laws that they're trying to figure out how do we make sure we're in compliance and implementing the changes. That's great. Thank you. So we'll be seeing some of that. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you, Ruth. I know this is a big area to always look at in the changes um, and more to come um, yes. if we see legislation next year. Oh, yes. Um, Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Okay, um, let's move on to item 6E, revisions of the financial operations guide FOG. And I think uh, Finance Director Julie Goucher is going to speak to this item. So I don't know about the rest of the council, but this is my Sunday napping document. <laughs> <laughs> Finance is good at it's helping good. people sleep at night. <laughs> um, so annually, the, the town does a review of their financial operations guide, which we all refer to as the FOG. And so this year when was my first opportunity to really review it from beginning to end. So many of the changes were just reorganization of information and adding headers consistent with the personnel handbook, which will come before you at some point. Um, and there were a couple of bigger changes. One, we removed a cell phone policy that's gonna now be incorporated into our personnel handbook. Uh, we also changed, there was a section called council adopted financial policies, which included um, a budget and fiscal policy together, but this entire document is council approved. So I split those documents up allowed me to get into a little bit more detail about some of the Gatsby fund um, balances. And we also updated exhibits, eliminated some outdated forms. Um, and then there were a few other large changes, um, or larger changes. 
One is that we recently went to ADP for our payroll processing, and so a lot of the um, that uh, that policy needed to be updated to reflect what we're actually doing now. Uh, we made some changes to our travel policy where um, we uh, looked at our reimbursement rates for mileage and local travel, so you'll see those. Uh, we also updated our cash management uh, receipts policy to address cash handling at our events, make sure that we've got proper controls and segregation of duties in place. Um, and then we also um, included a provision where the town manager is required to sign off on invoices more than $10,000. And we also require a uh, completion of a procurement form, which um, for any purchase over $10,000 that the department head needs to explain how they complied with our procurement. So whether it was something that needed to go out to bid or whether we were using the state contracts. So that was a change as well. And you'll see, I mean, there's many, many changes throughout the document, but most of them were more minor. So we just called out some of the larger ones, but I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the procurement form, are those things done electronically? Is there a way that, so if a staff member fills out that form, it feeds into your system so people aren't... It's not quite that savvy, but right we there. do have a, a shared drive that everybody has access to, and so the procurement form's there, so everybody knows that they can access it, and we ask them to attach that form to their invoice so that when the first invoice comes through, we can see, okay, this one's more than $10,000. This contract was for you know, a road project and we can see that it's been approved, it's gone to council and had an RFP, you know, that's, that's really the purpose. So it's still a paper world for us in finance until we, until we convert to a new accounting system, but one thing at a time. Exactly. <laughs> payroll, I'll be reeling from payroll for a little while. So yeah, keep payroll. Payroll. yeah. <laughs> Yes, I just want to say thank you. I know this is a tedious job going through this document and coming up with um, the changes that you did that make sense and bring us really in compliance. Thank so, you. Right. That's a lot of hard work and appreciate it. Thanks. I said to Julie. I think she likes this. <laughs> yeah, Julie likes this. Stuff. Some people uh, cry on it, but I said to Julie what was uh, heartening about this because she got to see it with her uh, fresh eyes yeah. uh, being new here. And prior to that, we had gone through a pretty extensive rework of our fiscal and financial policies with um, uh, Rob Sweeney. So it's nice to see, in, in fact, not that many changes had to be made. So the work that we did previously really set a good stage. And thank you, Julie. Yes, I mean, we did a really strong policy. I mean, many towns don't have a financial operation guide that is this comprehensive. So. I definitely appreciated having that to begin with. I mean, I'm usually starting from scratch with every policy. So that was a, a huge leg up. The only complaint I had was that it was so many years in the making that these Word documents were just corrupted and we were uh, kvetching earlier before the meeting about trying to update these policies where the formatting is just, you know, drives you a little crazy, but I prefer numbers. <laughs> I'm happy to have it done. <laughs> but I thank you and, and thank you for the, the work. And it was okay to have a Sunday afternoon nap with this. So, <laughs> yes. Um, are you ready for a motion? Yes, I am. I move that we approve the revisions to the financial operations guide. Is there a second? Okay, it's been moved by Council Member Babbitt Pearson, seconded by Council Member O'Neill to approve the revisions to the financial operations guide. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carried. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, item seven is feature agenda items. Um, I believe we have in front of us a list of items that we should probably expect at the next meeting. Uh, there's a, a few proclamations, uh, some new business. Um, it all looks uh, pretty straightforward. Um, that's coming next time. But is there anything else we want to add to um, the agenda in future items? No? I'm seeing nobody come up with anything. So. Um, We've got this. We just keep going forward, and I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting then. So moved. Second. Well, second. It's been moved by Vice Mayor Hunsetter and seconded by Council Member Babbitt Pierce to adjourn the meeting.
All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The meeting's adjourned at 6.54 p.m. Thank you all very much for being efficient tonight. Good job.